Dr. LaDonna Griffin is the founder of Leaders to Legends in Omaha, Nebraska. She works directly with families that are seeking a better alternative to educate their children. Uh, LaDonna worked in the Nebraska public schools as both a teacher and principal for 30 years. And then in 2018, she launched Leaders to Legend as a uh, resource for helping families to think about alternatives to traditional education, providing some consulting as she was on the tail end of her 30 year tenure in the public schools. And then in 2019, she retired from her role in the public schools and launched Leaders to Legends full-time. That program really accelerated in 2020 uh, due to the COVID education disruption. And she began creating Leaders to Legends as more than just consulting, but actually as a homeschool co-op called Leaders to Legends More Than Conquerors, homeschool co-op that continues to flourish today and really provides a partnership model uh, for families interested in a more learner-centered education outside of a conventional classroom. So I'm so thrilled to welcome Dr. LaDonna Griffin to the Liberated Podcast. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you, Carrie. It's great to have you here. I'm just so impressed by what you've built uh, in a relatively short period of time and moving from recognizing the need for alternatives to conventional education and then uh, seeing that you could create a co-op model, an in-person co-op model to really help families um, make that leap from a traditional classroom into something um, different. So I want to get to all of that in just a moment, LaDonna, but I'd love to start with the very beginning for you. Why did you go into education in the first place? What attracted you to being a public school teacher? Absolutely. And so um, I knew day one <laughs> that teaching was the key to um, addressing community being able to tap into communities, being a resident, uh, of a fourth generation resident of Omaha, Nebraska, in specifically North Omaha, born and raised, which I would consider to be a marginalized community, um, still choosing to reside there today. Um, I saw firsthand some of the things that marginalized communities um, may be considered as constraints, but I see them as opportunities. And so moving into education, that gave me the opportunity to work directly with families in marginalized communities from day one. Um, when I say day one, back in 1993. And so <laughs> um, I saw right away um, that there were things that collectively, if we work together, that they're not constraints. They truly are opportunities. And so um, definitely know I had my own daughter and then eight years later, a son, and uh, definitely seen the opportunity to work directly with families through education. So what was your public uh, school teaching experience like? What grades did you teach? What were some of your insights from your 30-year tenure as a teacher and administrator there? Absolutely. So I've taught uh, anywhere from uh, first grade through uh, middle school in varying school settings. All of the school settings have been urban school settings. Um, as an administrator, well, even as a teacher, I saw firsthand a lot of uh, children being suspended from school, which I struggled with. Um, because my thought, my mindset and thought has always been, this is an educational setting. We teach academics. If a child does not show us that they understand something socially, then that's a skill that's lacking. And so it is our moral and ethical responsibility as educators to teach that. Um, my last three years as principal, we designed and implemented a no suspension policy uh, practice. I should say practice because it was not a policy yet. It is now, <laughs> but it was a practice. Um, and if they lack the skill acad uh, academically or socially, it was our job to intervene. And so um, in the classroom setting, there was no pullout from special education students. We did uh, push in. I made sure there were three educators in the classroom from the paraprofessional to the classroom teacher and resource teacher at all times when we were teaching reading and math in every classroom. Also, if there was a child who um, was lacking a skill socially, then it was our job to teach it. And so during non-instructional times, we taught that skill. 
And then that child um, continued to learn the skill. Once they mastered it, they taught it to a younger child who may have been lacking that same skill. So there was a buddy system between children. The culture truly was shared values, love. I often got communication from district and parents um, who came in and said, oh my goodness, your culture of your building is just this culture of love. And so um, it was felt, it was productive. Uh, scores went up academically. There was no academic achievement gap during those years. And so it does work. It's a matter of just shifting that mindset of going, why are we sending children home if they're not understanding? Why not build and teach just as we are called to do? And so I, I, I will say those three years were the best three years of my educational journey. <laughs> Bravo. What incredible success. I love this culture of love that you created and really finding that through that love and that nurturing learning environment, it led to uh, what we would think of as kind of standard academic achievement, you know, test scores going up and achievement gaps narrowing um, just because of the culture that you created there. So uh, just congratulations to you for that. So at what point, LaDonna, did you start to think about alternatives to the traditional school system? What was that evolution like for you? I'll have to say that's always been in the background. Um, when I continued to see and speak with other administrators across the district, it was the same story, different building. And so um, the thought that there was a better way to do this um, because the, the bottom line is when you work for a public school district, there are mandates. And when you see those things not working, initially I go right to, well, this can work if we just did. And so it's always been there, even as a classroom teacher. Um, it's always been there. But having the freedom now to do just that, working directly with families who are saying, all I want is my child to succeed. All I want is a quality education for my child. And so it is. it has created a new space Leaders to Legends has where it is so exciting to see families really saying out loud, I truly have fallen in love with my child all over again. So now you are an education entrepreneur, having created Leaders to Legend, uh, which is, again, the sort of consulting practice, as well as this homeschool co-op for families. And you have lots of uh, goals for expanding Leaders to Legends and making a greater impact. But I'm curious to hear about your entrepreneurial journey. I know when we met in person back in June uh, in Washington, D.C. for a summit, you had said that uh, you come from a family of entrepreneurs and sort of grew up with this entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yes, now that was a complete transition from being in the public school system for 30 years to, okay, how do we build this thing from the ground up? And so um, I had a great model, which was my father. He come from a family of 10 and he um, ended up being a single parent, losing my mother at three years old and my oldest sister was eight. We saw day one, him building this uh, shared value within our family and creating this culture and his siblings ended up working for him through the entrepreneur route of his own cleaning business. Um, and while he was developing this, there were so many things that I didn't realize as a child that I was picking up along the way. I realize it now moving into the entrepreneurship world. And so um, I would say it's always been there again, but it was a matter of me taking the journey and stepping out and saying, uh, this is the correct way to assist the families that are that are sitting there, I literally say begging. I now just, recent, as of yesterday, met with families, sat down um, because they wanted assistance with completing the paperwork to start homeschooling. And so I now have a waiting list of families. Uh, the homeschool world is new to the North Omaha community. I won't say new to everyone, but the building, um, educating, equipping, and empowering, which is my mission with Leaders to Legends, families who did not know that there is a better way, there is an alternative, and it starts with you. And so being the coach and being kind of going right along with families as they're going through this journey has been amazing. The joy that I see from both child and parent has been the most beautiful thing ever. Uh, because they now feel empowered to educate their children using their own family values to do that. 
So I'd love to hear about how you went from launching your consulting practice to then this in-person micro school, essentially. It's a homeschool co-op, but the micro school is often the catch-all term for that. Um, because I think that's an interesting entrepreneurial path that my listeners and viewers might also want to follow, uh, sort of starting with hanging up your shingle as a consultant and then seeing that emerge into an in-person program. What what was that process like? Was that your intention? Did that develop organically? Tell us about that. Absolutely. So there were building blocks, again, that I didn't realize along the way. Back in 2006, when I completed my doctoral uh, degree, it was truly based on I had families coming into the school setting and I was teaching them how to teach reading in the home setting. And then my other group, I just sent the information home and I compared the two groups to see um, which group advanced more. And of course, the group that came in with their child was doing the activities right in front of them, building the, the um, ability to teach reading to their child in the home setting. They scored far greater on the standardized test than the families who had it just sent home to them. Uh, of course, that was back in 2006. So I had no idea <laughs> that I would be doing what I'm doing today. Um, transitioning to consulting business, I knew there were things as I was attending conferences and professional development and um, that there was a strong desire to have the ability to impact youth. And so I transitioned to consulting in a, in a hopes to assist whomever, not even just parents, but whoever had that strong desire to advance youth. Um, and going into a specific school that my own son attended, um, which was a private school for his middle school years, I ended up assisting that school for a year previous to launching the, the Leaders to Legends More Than Conquerors Homeschool Co-op. I knew um, while I was assisting in that private school, that same strong desire in the community, because this was a school that was in the community, but it was a private school. That's it's same story, different place. And so parents began to discuss and talk outside of that school, just that live in the community. And they were, they were asking for assistance with uh, some of the same things that I saw in the public school setting. And so that is what transitioned me into the full co-op, which may, I'll be honest, may someday transition into a full academy um, with the continual community saying, uh, these are the, the, having single parent families is something that just is in our community. And so now that is the most recent one saying, well, how do you address that? <laughs> so that is the topic of conversation at this time. Yeah. So what is attracting these families in North Omaha to homeschooling? You said that it's a marginalized community, that homeschooling is a relatively new idea. What was the kind of catalyst for interest in homeschooling in your area? I was. COVID had a lot to do with that. Um, when immediately families were pushed home and parents had to work, uh, yet they were students were asked to sit eight hours a day in front of a computer and learn from their instructor, um, which we know, all of us know, is not um, even child friendly. <laughs> that's not a good choice. Um, however, that's what was taking place even at the kindergarten level. And families were trying to navigate, well, I have to go to work but my child has to go to school, but school now is in the home. <laughs> so um, being able to building a community now, which is what the co-op is doing that says, yes, you have to work, but I can teach science. And so my parents are doing the teaching. Um, they're also being trained. Um, I'm doing some of the teaching as well. Um, if a parent cannot physically be in the space of the co-op during the teaching day, then they contribute in other ways. They may build the fundraiser. They may work with um, outreach and setting up some of our opportunities to go in the community because that's another piece that we do. The thought is you build a healthy community, then you naturally start to build other healthy communities as a part of that community. And you're seeing remarkable results already. I wonder if you can share a little bit about what you've discovered. Absolutely. So I will say we have a, um, I had a seven-year-old who joined this, this school year. Um, I'll, na I'll name him Braden for now. And Braden, um, he first joined and mom and I were sitting down. I was actually, we were teaching mom how to teach the reading curriculum that we were using. And he just, he would put his head down and he'd go, I cannot read. He would be so frustrated. I mean, to tears frustrated. 
And mom and I just continue. We agreed that we were going to continually say to him, if you don't quit, we won't quit. We know this is tough, but as long as you keep trying, you will be able to do it. I will say today, after a full year with us, um, with the, with the co-op, he is now reading. He is now asking, can we please do reading first? And mom made it clear. She said, I, I cannot get the books out of his hand at home. And so that that is exciting to see. It's so exciting to see. And it's uh, an important metric of success, right? I mean, you have a child who is struggling and is now a joyful reader, loves books, uh, you know, wants to be surrounded by literacy. You know, what an incredible marker of success and a testament to your work. Um, so, you know, I wonder if you think about the families that you're serving. I know you've mentioned to me that you think the family piece is really the crucial piece. It's sort of empowering parents. You said some of your families are single parents uh, raising their children alone. You know, what do you think? Why do you think that family connection, that family partnership is so crucial for successful learning? Well, and that, that's, a, I will say that's an individual experience of myself being raised in a single parent family uh, as well from a family of five. Um, the sibling support, the, the, it, the emotional and physical uh, security that happens in the home setting. And when you really think about it, a child who's, I'll say as young as three now, since we have the early childhood centers and you're sending your child to school, they're so much quality time that is missed um, when they're gone eight to 10 hours a day. When you take that back and you say, I may not have the quantity of time as a single parent, but I'm going to make sure all the time that I have is high quality. And so we really push that. Part of the training is the quality time is what's important. I can only speak to that because that's what I experienced. My father had to work. And he worked many hours building that business that he was building. But the time that he spent with us was quality time. And that is what made the difference in our um, educational journey. So Leaders to Legends really goes beyond education. Uh, you know, you have a mission of uh, alleviating intergenerational poverty and empowering uh, families and individuals. I wonder if you can share a little bit more about that broader vision. Absolutely. And so the, the truly, if you if you feel empowered as an individual, each one of us, if we feel good about who we are and what we are doing, we naturally want others to feel that way. And so uh, one piece, very essential piece of Leaders to Legends is um, we're not a handout, we're a hand up. And so we collectively work together of if there's a need and I'm a family who sees a need in another family and I can assist with that need, I just naturally do it because now we're in this community that we just do that. I have a mom's retreat. Last year was a mini mom's retreat where the moms came in uh, and the building setting. It was right around Mother's Day that time. And they had mini massages. Um, they got nails done because uh, one of our parents was a cosmetologist and she did nails. So she was the one who did the nails. And then they had a makeup done. And oh, just the faces and the oh my good, just em again, empowering, feeling good about yourself. This year, I have brought in that in August, we're going on a two day retreat, collectively together, where we stay all night um, at a retreat center for two nights from seven in the morning until, and they cannot have any contact with families. Dads are so ready. It's so funny. They're like, oh my goodness. <laughs> But we're excited about that because it's really about building themselves up. Because once you build yourself up, then you have something to pour out someone else. And that is the goal. Uh, one other piece is we know um, through COVID times, that inflation that's happened with food and those pieces, we do have once a week a pantry um, for me working collectively with uh, uh, organization here in Nebraska. So once a week, each family does take home a food pantry that they so appreciate. Um, and they've also uh, shared that it has been very beneficial through this time of, you know, navigating, I'll say the effects of COVID and the inflation and food and gas prices and all those other pieces there. Yeah, so I love that that motto of you're providing a hand up, not a hand out, that you're really empowering individuals to rise above um, whatever, you know, sort of income um, limitations they may have, or again, sort of 
uh, legacy of intergenerational poverty and helping them to move beyond that uh, through empowerment and um, and education uh, in all of these different ways. So I think that's so exciting. So Ladonna, tell us about the composition of the co-op right now. You know, who, uh, how many students do you have? How often are they coming to the program? What are their ages? Sort of the, those basic details. Absolutely. So our youngest is four years old currently. Um, we have about 17 students. Um, this year we will have a senior. So this will be our first senior. Um, the, and she will graduate at the end of this year. Um, uh, parents are teaching. We have a, I, I love the husband and wife, uh, they co-teach science. And so one day dad's teaching, the next day mom's teaching, but it's awesome because the curriculum is so consistent because they discuss it in the home setting. Um, so parents are doing the teaching. Um, we come together three days a week. We use a shared curriculum. Some of the teaching is happening in the home setting on the two days of the week that are not there. And then we do we use the shared curriculum also during the three days they're there. So Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we're all together, collectively working out of the same curriculum. Our school day um, is nine until three on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays. So you said that there's growing interest uh, in the Leaders to Legends homeschool co-op. You have a vision for this to be uh, all over Nebraska, and you're not content with North Omaha being the only location. Tell us a little bit about your uh, goals for the future, what you would love to see happen, say over the next five years with Leaders to Legends. Absolutely, over the next five years, I'm hoping to tap into some of the um, rural communities here in Nebraska as well that are experiencing the same things. Um, I will say uh, the last three weeks I've had, we've had two sessions just to introduce homeschooling and what it is. I have um, reached out to Nebraska Homeschool, which is an organization here in Nebraska who um, only knows homeschooling. That has been the uh, generationally how education has happened. And so Nebraska Homeschool has had information sessions that now my parents attend previous to joining Leaders to Legends so, so that we start to build right away the hand up, not a handout model. It's not a recreation of the public school system. It is where parents are directing the education of their children. And so um, after attending that information session, just yesterday we met at a campus, the community college campus, because parents wanted assistance with completing the uh, paperwork that's required. And so they all came together, had all the documents they needed, and they sat down and completed their paperwork. And um, now the next step is we will discuss uh, what it looks like to be a part of Leaders to Legends. And so, yes, I do have families who are, um, that number will increase this year as far as the number of families that we are serving. And what about your growth strategy? Ideally, uh, what would you love to see across Nebraska or elsewhere uh, in the coming years? Absolutely. These communities of collectively together, there's nothing we can't do. Where there's a will, there's always a way. I've always seen poverty as a resiliency that's formed in a child over years. When love is in the picture, love prevails every time, regardless of the constraints that exist. I think of the uh, Pursuit of Happiness, Will Smith's movie, when they were in the bathroom and he made his child, um, although they were homeless, his child never knew that. It was now, this is our playground the same thing. How we capture poverty, how we deliver poverty is all up to us. And so understanding, yes, these things exist. Yes, I have to work to bring food home and make sure you have your the basic needs met. But I have the authority to do that as the parent. And with the support of a co-op or a community, all things are possible. So I want to step back for a minute, LaDonna, because um, I think it's interesting that you uh, taught in the public schools for 30 years, again, as a teacher and an administrator, your children who are now grown and quite successful went through a conventional schooling model. Um, and yet you're so passionate now about alternative education and particularly parent directed education. Tell us about that, right? Because it seems like a disconnect. Absolutely, and definitely understood. And initially, I will say, um, 
I sat back and just, you know, thought about how this all took place in my life. The real truth is, as a public school educator, it was tough. It was tough as a principal. Um, when we, I come from a community who has 100% trust in teachers, they really did. It started out as teacher is always right. However, over the years, I started to see parents seeing, hmm, there are some other components of this that hasn't been addressed. But sitting in that seat as principal, I was the face of the school, I was the face of the district, and I had to be just that. And that's a tough spot to be in when you really sit there and you have all of the pieces and understand how this child got there and how to get them out of there, <laughs> out of that moment of crisis in the school setting. Um, so that was a tough seat. However, I knew that this could be done and our children could succeed. They're not failing because they're not able. They were failing because of the mandates of the structures and the structures of a public school government ran school. And so that's how that was really my transition to uh, alternative education. Yeah, and now it seems like there's more of a doubling down on standardized schooling, more testing, um, especially in the wake of pandemic learning loss. There's even more of a focus on um, longer school days or longer school years, more intensive tutoring and drilling content uh, to close these uh, perceived achievement gaps. And you're saying, wait a minute, look elsewhere, look outside of that system for solutions. Is that a fair uh, assessment? Absolutely. I will say even with my own son, um, who is now 22, um, but, and work, he'll start his master's uh, degree this year. However, when he was in the school system, in the public school system specifically, about sixth grade, of course, I knew all the schools. So what did I do? I sent him to the highest academic school that I was aware of. And so while he was there, though, I had begged, and I'm a principal at this time, I begged for him to be tested because I saw with math, he was off the chart. His reasonableness, he just, he just, he could figure out math so quickly that it was like, this is amazing me. <laughs> and so... Um, I had to ask numerous times for him to be tested. Initially, they would not test him. After speaking with district offices and working with the school, they finally did test him. When they tested him, they called me in for the meeting and they said to me, um, you're correct. You're absolutely correct. Your son scored off the charts in math. However, we will not be servicing him because we have other smart children who attend this school as well. I was so shocked and overwhelmed <laughs> that I pulled him out of school that day. I had no idea what I was going to do. At that time, I was a single parent. I was not, um, I didn't have a community who said, you know what, come be a part of this co-op and we'll be able to do this. And so he ended up in private school. And that's the same private school that I worked with for a year uh, previous to starting the co-op. Um, and so I would say, Alternative to education is the answer to what we're seeing. For so many years, parents have been not given 100%. What do you see as the answer? But I can tell you, as a school principal, that was the only way I knew how to do it. As a school principal, before I started the zero uh, suspension po uh, policy practices at the school I was at, I had a child come to me from my neighborhood school. She was a first grader. I opened up her charts and of course, 72 times she had been suspended from school in kindergarten. And so when she came, I immediately reached out to the parent and I asked mom to come in and meet with me. And I said to her, we can do this. We can do this together. But I, if I call you, cause I'm gonna need you. I can't do this without you. There's a relationship that she has with you that's so crucial. And so will you please not take her home anytime I call you up to the school. One, she was so shocked because she was like, what do you mean not take her home? That's the only thing I know. <laughs> so um, at the end of that school year, and it was work between myself, the counselor, the teacher, and the PAC facilitator, we, we knew going in, we're gonna create success here. At the end of that school year, this uh, child scored the highest academically in her classroom on both reading and math, both. And that was just all the groundwork to say, man, when parents are leading the way, 
it is all possible because no one knows their child better than them. And they want the same things that classroom teachers want. And that's a quality education for each child. So Nebraska just recently um, passed school choice legislation that enables more education funding to follow students. How do you see that policy or the expansion of school choice uh, impacting more of these alternative options for families? I will tell you, I, I, um, knowing the demographics of Nebraska, uh, even when I'm, I'm a little concerned because say parents choose, I want to go to a private school. We can't meet that need. We don't have private schools who are just waiting for kids. <laughs> and so um, I do predict that there are going to be some schools opening up, um, exempt schools opening up here in Nebraska along the way so that they can meet the need that's going to happen with the school choice funding. Yeah, and hopefully some of these school choice policies across the country that right now are targeting um, private schools and in some cases accredited private schools only, hopefully there'll be a, a larger embrace of more of these alternative education programs like Leaders to Legends. We're seeing that happen in some states such as Arizona that has a universal education savings account program um, that does enable education funding to go to resource centers and homeschool programming like yours. Uh, and hopefully the same is true in more states that are implementing these policies so that more families really have access to this. Um, so I wonder, you know, what, what do you think, LaDonna, about the future of American education? I mean, do you think that these um, more kind of parent-driven alternative education programs are going to continue to grow? Do you think they'll always be sort of on the margins? What is your sense of the future of education? Absolutely, I will say, just as you were speaking, I know I spoke with you previously about this, Carrie, when we were in DC. Um, the funding I'm nervous about because I wanna make sure Parent Directed continues. <laughs> and so as long as Parent Directed can continue because there is power in parent directed regardless of the socioeconomic status, regardless of the uh, marginalized communities. Parent directed is so important. I've, I've seen it year after year over and over again, what happens when parents are leading the way. Um, but I do believe well, what I see happening, um, it's, such, it's such a broader picture uh, from COVID and pandemic and everything that is going on in our world. I do believe our children, children are ready, especially young men, uh, the boys, they're ready seventh, eighth grade. I see education taking a new space where you're already headed towards uh, your, your, your career, your job, your working status at a much younger age than 12th grade. And so I see schools looking completely different than what they do right now. Uh, there's discussion happening right now as young as fifth grade, what career choice do you choose? And so I don't think college will look, and I say this is in the next seven to 10 years, education is going to look completely different. It's exciting to imagine uh, what education will look like. Hopefully it becomes much more personalized and learner centered, and there's many more choices for families um, so they can find just the right educational fit for their child. So LaDonna, how can my listeners and viewers connect with you, learn more about Leaders to Legends and the work that you're doing? Absolutely. I would uh, definitely ask that um, listeners follow us on Facebook. Go ahead and like and share uh, because it does give a broad scope of um, what it looks like when education is family centered family focus with shared values in the community. And so, yes, follow, like and follow us on Facebook is a good start. LaDonna Griffin, thank you so much for being on the Liberated Podcast. And thank you as well, Carrie. I enjoyed every bit of it.